Hi everyone, thanks for coming. My name is Yasmina Sazdoska. I'm the head of the language department at the International Business School here in Budapest. And uh, um, what I would like to um, talk to you today uh, about is um, uh, together with the theme of um, IATEFL, looking forward, looking back, I thought we could take an overview of the language teaching methodologies that have come up uh, over the past uh, 50 years or so, and perhaps take a look then forward and see what we might expect. And within that frame, I thought we could take a look at whether there might be a brighter future in store for non-native speakers or teachers of English, uh, because it seems uh, that lately uh, teaching has been sort of um, quite uh, centered around native speakers and they seem to have the upper hand. So I was just wondering whether the situation is ripe for us uh, to challenge this point of view. So the first thing I would like to start with is looking back. Uh, and um, what I thought we could do is look at the um, different methodologies, as I mentioned, that have come up over the past, um, I don't know, 50 years in teaching, and uh, discuss them later on. So I've got some handouts here. In the first one, you can see the teaching methodologies at the top, and in the, on the second page, you can find a description of the different teaching methodologies. And what I'd like you to do is here in the first column, write up which of the teaching methodologies, the titles, the name of them. OK? So take some handouts and pass them around. And the online viewers can also find the um, handout on the blog. So it's available for the online viewers as well. If you find it easier to work in pairs, you can also discuss it. And I've uh, put a paper clip on so that you can actually detach the pages and, and look at the two papers parallel. I think it helps. Yeah. Yeah, 14. Yeah, extra, good. Sorry, but I, I, I thought a workshop would be literally work. <laughs> Tanya, good to see you. Yes. Yes, you can even fold the page. I've got them here as well, if you want to look at the methods, that should help. to help you out. There are some hints in the description. Yeah. So if, if you find the keywords in the main traits, the keywords should help you out. OK. 
Okay, one more minute, so even if we haven't covered all of them, just to get an idea. Okay, I think we should perhaps take a look jointly together. Uh, so I actually, I've listed them here on, on this slide in order that you see them listed on your handout. So number one would be grammar translation, second the direct method, third audio lingual, fourth silent, fifth suggestopedia or desuggestopedia, some, some people call it, sixth. Uh, community language, second, total physical response, uh, next is communicative language teaching, then content-based, task-based, participatory approach, um, language strategy learning, cooperative learning, and the last one is multiple intelligences. Okay? I'll give you a second to put those down, if the ones that are missing. Okay, now, looking at the bewilderment of uh, methods that we have on offer, which do you think are the main two or three that uh, teachers seem to be focusing on or selecting? Because it seems that they're not all of equal popularity, I think. Communicative? I personally sometimes it is the yes. Uh-huh. Sorry? Multiple intelligences. Multiple intelligences. We do like to see what our learners' t learning styles are like and try to match those up. It's very popular now with the visual, the audio, the kinesthetic, and so, so on. Task-based. Task-based. A lot of us use task-based. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody still using grammar translation but is shy to admit? You do? Some, some of you. Uh-huh. Actually, this is one of the things that I would like to challenge in this workshop. So I think it's very, very difficult for teachers to find their way uh, around in this bewildering array of teaching methodologies out there. And I think um, we, we tend to try and stick to one and, and, and see what we can do. And it's, at least for me, it's difficult to try and decide for one thing that I should stick to in all situations. So we seem to be stuck with a choice, whether we choose one, which is the best for all situations, that's absolutism, or whether we say, well, it depends. In certain situations I would use task-based, in other situations I might use elements of grammar translation, in other situations I might use some of this. But then, if there's no right or wrong way, and if we say it depends, then my question is, what? 
Exactly. It depends on what. What does it depend on? And I think one of the things that we might want to look at is the setting in, in which we, we uh, teach. Is it an uh, English as a second language or English as a foreign language setting? Is the teacher a non-native teacher or a native teacher? Okay. For the current communicative approach, which of these do you think we would, we would be selecting? Yeah. Hmm? Okay, for, for us here, okay? And um, also I would think that the different methods that we have on offer focus on different aspects of communicative competence. You can find these aspects of communicative competence on your third handout. And um, there's the discourse communicative competence, the discourse element which focuses on how we structure communication linguistic, both grammar and vocab, sociocultural, looking at the role of uh, culture and society on uh, communication, so trying to make your uh, communication suitable for the purposes and the uh, participants in the talk. Actional, this is for speech acts and the functional notional approach. Uh, what function are we accomplishing? Are we inviting, rejecting, accepting and so on? And strategic in terms of communication strategies. Are we avoiding? Are we putting things together? How are we uh, structuring our talk in general? So I think these are the elements which would uh, be part of what influences our decision on which methods we take. So that was looking back. Now let's take a look at the here and now and what is covering going on at the moment. Um, for your personal setting, you said that you have uh, an EFL setting and non-native, right? But which one is, which of the teaching methods do you think are the most popular right now? Communicative. And communicative uh, a teaching methodology would be favoured by which non-native teachers or native? native? Both. But some of you said native, okay? And I think that's the case and it would be more suitable, I think, for English as a second language rather than for English as a foreign language. I'll tell you why in a, in a few minutes. Um, which of the uh, communicative uh, uh, components of communicative competence do you think that the communicative method focuses on? Actional. Actional, yes. More? Social Absolutely, yes, and strategic. So these are the three, I've highlighted them in red, that uh, the communicative approach seems to be focusing on. But if we think about uh, the society and if we think about we need to make our uh, contribution uh, appropriate for the listeners, then the question comes up, appropriate for whom? Who is it that we teach our students to fit in with? Are they going to go out into the world and communicate with native speakers or are they going to go out in the world and communicate with non-native speakers? And this got me thinking about uh, Karchu's um, circles of um, uh, teaching. And um, in the inner circle we have uh, the uh, countries where English is spoken as the first language, native speakers. In the outer circle we have uh, the uh, countries where English is the second language. And in the expanding circle we have English as a foreign language. And if we're teaching English as a second language, then we're teaching probably uh, either in the uh, inner or in the outer circle. And if we're teaching English as a foreign language, then we're probably teaching either in Hungary or in another place where English is uh, a means of communication with non-native speakers. But with the spread of English as a lingua franca, we're coming to uh, the conclusion that um, only 20% of speakers of English are actually native speakers. It seems that 80% of speakers are non-native speakers. So when our students leave the classroom, 
they will most likely be speaking with other non-native speakers, unless they have a specific aim of moving to the UK or US or uh, Australia. Uh, it seems that in most situations, uh, in uh, four situations out of five, they will be using English to communicate with other non-native speakers. And this then raises the question for me, well, if we are using the native speaker's standards, are we teaching them to be appropriate in only one out of five situations? If we go back to this slide, four out of five situations are with non-native speakers, and if with the communicative approach we are putting the native speaker's standards of acceptability and pragmatic uh, competences into the uh, center of attention, then we're making our students appropriate for one in five situations. And this got me thinking about the future and uh, what we should need to be doing in the future. And I think that, yeah, you, you like the quote, it's by Abraham Lincoln, and I think the best way to predict the future is to create it. And um, in the teaching community, I think we, we are now mature enough as, as teachers in terms of having uh, been teaching uh, English, not just as individuals mature, but individuals as a teaching community in terms of, for example, IATEFL now reaching 25 years, a jubilee. I think it's, it's time in the teaching profession that we should be starting to ask ourselves some critical questions about what is it that we're supposed to be doing. And I would like to propose that we need to be making our students capable of uh, being appropriate for four out of five situations, not one out of five. And that means um, looking at the standards of English as a foreign language and bringing back the non-native uh, communicator, not just teacher, into the center of attention. In terms of the competences, which ones do you think I would uh, be advocating that we focus on? This course? Uh, actually, it's a trick question. I don't think we should be um, looking at communicative competence in these discrete ways. I think it takes all of these to make an effective communicator. We need both the grammar and the vocabulary and discourse. We need social, cultural, uh, but which social, which culture is a question mark. We need actional, we need to be performing speech acts, and we need strategic competence. So I think uh, a good teacher is one who makes students focus on all of the communicative uh, components and makes uh, students capable of communicating in many different situations, a large variety of situations. And what does that mean in terms of the choice for um, the teaching methods that we've just discussed? Is it absolutism or relativism? And again, I would like to propose a third way of, of dealing with that, and that would be an eclectic approach, where we look at all the different methodologies and we start in a more mature way picking and choosing elements of different methodologies that we need for our own particular situation and tailoring our own method to our students and our school and our situation and seeing what we need from these different methods to help our students in the most effective way. Um, a couple of years ago at IBS, we uh, did a study together with my colleague here, Djergi, um, on um, the IBS uh, uh, employers, so our students from the International Business School graduate, and then we were wondering what sort of skills do employers need from our students? Because we thought that this particular survey would then make us have informed decisions about what we need to be teaching them. We carried this study out in um, January 2013 and we presented some of the findings of this study two years ago at uh, the IATEFL conference. We sent it out to 100 international companies and we had 32 companies respond to us. And these are the findings. Surprisingly, one of the major tasks that employers want fresh graduates to do in the workplace is translate. This is becoming a lost art. 
and it seems that they expect it to be done automatically, not by students who are specialized in English language and who are specialized um, translators, but they expect this task to be carried out by business students who just happen to speak English, French or German. And they wanted them to translate. The second one is written correspondence. They wanted lots of students to be able to translate reports and things. Think about how much written uh, tasks we give students. Not very many these days. Oral communication, of course, was included, presentations, meetings, and so on. And they wanted multilingual employees who speak at least one other language apart from English and their native language. So this is now the trend in Europe. And what I think this makes for our informed choices is, first of all, we need to start thinking about reintroducing translation and written correspondence. Which of the methods focuses on this? Grammar translation. And I think there's nothing wrong with reintroducing a few elements, not perhaps the drilling th things, but looking at uh, w communicatively reintroducing translation into the language classroom. Oral communication, of course, this is self-evident, and that's the communicative approach. Uh, what about um, this last element, multilingual employees and speaking a third language? Can we, in the English language classroom, help students learn another language? Sure. And which of the methods do we need to employ for that? Yeah, they, we could be translating, but that's already teaching a different language. But in teaching English, can I give them any transferable skills that would help them learn another language? Somewhere lower down on the list. Can I give them some strategies for learning that will help them? Yes, language strategy instruction. If I tell them how to read a text and skim, and get the gist of it with keywords, then they can use that in any language. That's a transferable, concrete skill that they can use for any language. And I think we need to be looking at these ways of creatively combining the methodologies. So the way forward is to select and combine methods, to reintroduce translation, to look at the benefit of the native language, not to ban it from the language classroom. This is a language classroom, so any language should be useful, including the native language. And this is where I think non-native teachers who speak the native language could have the upper hand. Looking at ways of providing a better learner model. If we ourselves, as non-native speakers, have managed to master uh, the language to this level of command, then perhaps we can give a positive and encouraging example to our students that they can do the same. And listen, when I was learning English, it helped me to remember this tense in this way. Maybe you could do the same thing. And again, I think this strategy, uh, providing that type of model for students, is particularly important. Uh, and again, teaching language learning strategies goes with that. I think it's important to foster cross-cultural communication. So not focus on the culture of the native speakers, because most of our students will not be going to these countries, but they will be uh, included in international communication and being able to cross cultures within communication is more important than being familiar with Humpty Dumpty, Big Ben and Shepherd's Pie. Okay? And finally, being more sensitive to our students' needs and uh, na non-native teachers have been proved to be uh, more empathetic uh, to their students rather than native teachers. And somebody who's been doing a lot of research in this area is Peter Medjesh. And uh, we've been also uh, commemorating his 70th birthday at this conference. And I thought it fitting that his research really coincides a lot with the topic that I'm covering. These are just a few of the um, readings that, or, or uh, articles that he's published on this, including a book on non-native speakers. And these are some of the findings that he came to. Um, nests are native English-speaking teachers, and non-nests are non-native English-speaking teachers. 
And you can see that non-native are more cautious, more empathic, they go ahead with real needs and expectations, and they are more committed. And more committed to me means um, spending more time on self-development, on study, on uh, getting qualifications, on being familiar with the teaching methods so that we can combine them. Also, um, the uh, non-native teachers use feel free to use the native language, use more translation and less culture, which according to the findings that we just saw about uh, English as a lingua franca, I think are highly relevant. And these are uh, from a table in Peter Majors's research and book on non-native speaker. So finally, to conclude, what I think we need for the future is a teacher who is eclectic, a teacher who has a large repertoire of um, teaching methodologies that they can use when and if needed specifically for their own classroom. I think uh, a good teacher is one who can make informed decisions about the teaching methods for their own students. And in order to be able to make these informed decisions, they need to be highly qualified. They need to be trained, not only as a teacher, but in the English language and in linguistics in general, how languages in plural function, so that they can be a multilingual and a multicultural language teacher. Because I think that having a monolingual language teacher is a paradox that we can no longer afford to have in the classroom in the 21st century. So for me, the question is whether perhaps this might be the non-native teacher. It could be a native teacher who's highly qualified, but that teacher would need to learn the native language of the students, would need to learn several languages, and would need to be highly informed. So going back to the theme of the conference, looking forward, looking back, we've looked back at our a few uh, teaching methods, we've looked forward, and I really wouldn't like to stick to one uh, message, but what I would like to say is that there are changes ahead in terms of the international language, internationalization of English, and um, these changes do and should have consequences in the classroom. How we interpret that is up to us. So thank you very much. I think that's... Uh, my time completed exactly one o'clock and this is my email address so um, please feel free to contact me with um, any questions or comments that you might have on the workshop both people here and those of uh, our viewers uh, watching uh, the streaming session so thank you very much <laughs>